Hi guys, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to another video where today we're going to be finally closing off Mussolini's rise to power by looking at the main event during the 1910s and the 1920s that allowed Mussolini to grow to the premiership of Italy. If you have been following the videos on this channel very closely guys, you will know that this is the fifth part of Mussolini's rise to power, which is why before watching this video, I highly encourage you all to check out all of the four previous ones because they largely complement everything that we're going to be talking about today. You get some really good context about about what we discussed today and you won't be very uh, lost and you'll be able to follow the ideas very clearly. Specifically, if you watched the last video on this channel where we discussed Mussolini's use of ideology in persuading the Italian population and uh, uh, increasing his support base so he could grow in his political career. With that said guys, let's get on with the video because today we're going to be discussing how Mussolini used persuasion, political maneuvers, uh, coercion and even sometimes violence to ascend to the premiership of Italy and become the prime minister of the country in 1922. So let's get started. Alright guys, so the first major event that we have to discuss is the Italian national elections of May 1921, which marked the first time that Mussolini was able to hold a seat in the Italian government. So let's take a look at how this happened. If you have watched the last video on this channel, you will know that although Mussolini had no public office or had a position in government during the 1910s, he was growing as an extremely powerful and influential figure in Italian politics and society as well. Not only because he was an eloquent public speaker and riled up a significant support base with right-wing Italians, but also because he was quickly ascending to the leadership of the fascists and of the black shirts, who as we know were these unstoppable forces in Italian society that truly controlled the streets of Italy. Because Mussolini was controlling the black shirts, he was becoming almost as powerful as the Italian government, which naturally caught the eye of the Italian Prime Minister at the time, Giovanni Giolitti, who wanted to form an alliance or a partnership with Mussolini to get him on his side. After all, Mussolini was becoming very, very influential. And the way that Giolitti did this was by inviting Mussolini to join a center-right national bloc in the upcoming elections of May 1921. The National Bloc was essentially a coalition between center and right-wing politicians who wanted to run for office together and attempt to hold a majority in the Italian parliament, which was called the Chamber of Deputies, in order to fight off their uh, common threat that was the left-wing at the time. This was going to be something naturally very good for Giolitti, given that he was going to be uh, harnessing the influence of Mussolini, who, like I said, was becoming very, very powerful, and was equally as beneficial for Mussolini as well, because by joining this national bloc, which also saw other prominent politicians like the prime minister himself, he was going to be able to hold a public office and for the first time effectively implement his ideas in the Italian government. And so, to briefly summarize everything that happened after this point, Mussolini accepted and joined the National Bloc, effectively winning a seat in Parliament. The only problem, however, is that the National Bloc failed to achieve a majority in the Chamber of Deputies, as not all of the politicians that joined it actually won a seat in Parliament. But to be very honest, the failure of the National Bloc did not harm Mussolini much at all. He won a seat in Parliament after all, which meant that now he could ascend in his career and in Italian society through the political system, portraying himself as a legitimate, credible politician and appealed to Italians that were previously skeptical of him. It was now easier for him to rile up the fascists and to increase his support base as well, which meant that in reality, the national elections were very, very good for Mussolini. However, the same cannot be said in regards to Prime Minister Giolitti, given that the whole point of including Mussolini in his national bloc was to use some of Mussolini's power and influence to pass the policies that the national bloc would propose in the Chamber of Deputies. Yet as the national bloc failed and very few center-right um, politicians of the national bloc actually won a seat in parliament, uh, the prime minister had no way of doing that even with Mussolini in the chamber of deputies. In fact, the situation only worse for the prime minister, given that he had now placed Mussolini in a very powerful position in the Italian government, which would make it very easy for Mussolini to undermine him in the future. Alright guys, so moving on from this factor, Mussolini was now a member of parliament, which meant that he could use the political process and political vessels to spread his ideas and consolidate even more support. Which leads us to the next factor that we're going to be discussing, which is Squadrismo, which was the process of consolidating the fascists 
under the fascist banner. Now being an established politician, Mussolini was able to consolidate these small fascist groups in a much more effective manner, using speeches, rallies, national movements, and other methods of communication, he was able to unite all of these groups under the fascist banner. And because they were still the only way of effectively keeping order, as they were still very influential in Italian society and in Italian streets, Mussolini's power and prestige only grew stronger and stronger. Like I said before, the National Bloc had indeed failed in 1921, but the very opposite can be said in regards to Mussolini's parties, rallies, and speeches, which grew exponentially in support, often seeing the tens of thousands of people showing up to hear Mussolini's messages. The more people that showed up to fascist rallies, the more people were attracted, and quickly fascism became a national movement with the fascist party growing to astronomic proportions. To give you guys some perspective, party membership rose to 320,000, 7% of which were armed black shirts. 7% doesn't seem like a lot, but just imagine the scenario for a moment. 7% of 320,000 equates to around 2,200 armed men on the streets, all of whom were ready to follow Mussolini's orders and implement whatever he said. And this just gives you guys some perspective of how much power Mussolini truly had in Italian society, not only on a political front by being this very prominent politician that was truly riling up support uh, with the Italian nation, but also by having a significant number of armed men in the street that could uh, obey his orders at the snap of a finger and implement whatever he wanted. Here we can see the first traces of an authoritarian state as Mussolini, even before becoming prime minister, was using violence, coercion, and uh, brute force to promote his ideology and to fight for fascism. Also guys, what is interesting to notice is that this time also marked a change in the name of the fascist party. As we looked at in our last video, it was previously called the Fascist Revolutionary Party, with many historians speculating that the word revolutionary suggested that there were still some underlying uh, connotations and underlying lingerings of socialism within Mussolini's personal ideology. If you don't understand this, go check out our last video because I explained this idea much more in depth. But now, the Fascist Party was known as the Fascist National Party, which is a very interesting uh, name change because by dropping the word revolutionary, and changing it with the word national, we can truly see how Mussolini had completely abandoned the socialist ideology and was now fully committed to the fascist movement. And on this note, let's move on to the next factor that we're going to be discussing, which is the fascist national party itself, which was also called the PNF. What is interesting about the PNF is that it marks some of Mussolini's key realizations, politically and ideologically. Politically, Mussolini realized that he had to ascend to power through the political process, which was a very similar realization to what Hitler had following the failure of the Birhal Putsch when he was sent to jail. As following that failure, uh, Hitler realized that he could not simply attempt to overthrow the Weimar government, and that he had to slowly ascend through the political process if he was going to become the Chancellor of Germany. The situation here is very similar, given that this is the first time that Mussolini truly understood that he could not become the Prime Minister of Italy by using the black shirts to install terror and chaos in Italian streets, but rather that he, he had to use the black shirts as this force that would implement his policies in Italian society, whilst parallelly using the political process and his political career to become a legitimate uh, politician and eventually the legitimate leader of Italy. Ideologically, however, with the establishment of the PNF, Mussolini also altered his main focus group, which he targeted to rally a significant support base. We know that during the times of the fascist revolutionary party, the main focus group for the fascist party was the working class, which is why the party proposed policies that were beneficial for that group, uh, hoping to incite them to support the fascist party. But now things were very different, and the main focus group for the party became the property only middle class which naturally encouraged some great ideological changes for Mussolini and for the fascist party because the middle class had very different interests than the working class, which meant that the party now had to propose some very different things. For example, now Mussolini argued towards the freedom of the church and he also dropped uh, the wealth tax, which was something that he had proposed back in 1919. And this leads us to a very interesting piece of historiography, which is actually a criticism by many historians who argued that Mussolini cynically followed the money by adopting a completely different fascist program that sought to defend businesses from syndicalism and uh, socialism and trade unions as well, which was a very different type of socialism than what Mussolini had previously proposed during the times of the PRF. 
These historians argued that Mussolini's fascism was not a solid and concrete ideology in itself, but rather one that he could adapt, uh, remold, and reshape in order to uh, attract those that were willing to finance his political ascent, which is why we see very different types of fascism throughout Mussolini's rise and consolidation of power, as he was constantly remolding the ideology and adapting, adopting different programs in order to fit the interests of those that were willing to finance the fascist party. And although this ideological shape-shifting proved to be very convenient for Mussolini, allowing him to change the fascist doctrine to fit the interests of those that were willing to support him, it also proved to have some great adverse effects. For once, it damaged his working class support base on a massive scale, and not only that, it pushed the working class into the arms of socialism and into the arms of socialist trade unions. To give you some perspective, following this ideological change by Mussolini, uh, socialist trade unions grew in membership quite massively, from 250,000 in 1918 to 2 million in 1920. However guys, these ideological inconsistencies by Mussolini, if anything, allowed him to continue growing exponentially as a prominent politician, becoming more and more so the face of a nationwide movement that was slowly becoming an unstoppable force in Italy. So now let's take a look at the final event that allowed Mussolini to hold the premiership of Italy, effectively allowing him to become the prime minister of the country, which was of course the march to Rome in 1922. To give you guys some context in the march to Rome, in the beginning of 1922, the king of Italy, Vittorio Emmanuel, who held the power of appointing the prime minister of Italy, appointed the liberal politician Luigi Facta to the position of prime minister. And this naturally enraged all of the fascists all across the country as they voiced their discontent wanting Mussolini to be prime minister instead. And this massively increased their already existing criticism of the monarchy by the fascists. If you don't know, the fascists were in favor of the Italian Republic, which naturally meant the downfall of the Italian kingdom. But now they were even more enraged with the monarchy, given that they thought it was completely unfair that a liberal was appointed to the premiership, given that the fascist movement had grown to such astronomic proportions in the country. Later, however, on October 24th, during a rally in Naples, Mussolini addressed 60,000 Italians and again, with his ideological inconsistencies, completely changed his viewpoint on democracy and claimed support for the monarchy instead. He eloquently spoke that Italy had been divided on this matter between democracy and monarchy for far too long now, and argued that the only way for Italy to thrive as a nation and for Italian greatness to be achieved was for the nation to be united under a strong leadership, which is why he claimed to support the monarchy at this time and drop his support for democracy. However, although Mussolini's support for the monarchy would have been something very positive for the king, as it would have incited others to support him as well, his support was rather bittersweet, because in parallel to it, Mussolini threatened to take the nation by violence and the Italian government by force, and demanded that at least six government positions be given to fascist officials. And he did this because he was outraged that fascism had become this massive movement in Italy, yet no fascists had been considered to government positions. And so, on October 28th, 30,000 armed fascists marched 150 miles to Rome, spreading panic all around the nation as they were essentially going to the capital of the country advocating for Mussolini's demands. Yet, although a lot of Italians were truly terrified with the supposed fascist uprising, the newly elected Prime Minister Facta knew that this was just a show that the fascists were putting on, and he also knew that the Italian army could easily suppress all of the fascists marching down to Rome. However, when he requested the king's permission to deploy troops to suppress the fascists, the king, for unknown reasons to this day, said no, refusing to deploy the troops to uh, effectively suppress all of this fascist movement that was going on. This naturally outraged Facta, who believed that the king was allowing the fascists to carry out an activity that was undermining the new government's uh, prestige, as they were indeed uh, challenging the new authority in the country, and so Facta resigned. And so, in a rather poetic and quite epic way, if I'm being quite honest, Mussolini joined the fascist march right as they were entering Rome, and marched into Rome where the king would call upon him to become the new prime minister of Italy. All right. So there we go guys, Mussolini had effectively risen to the premiership of Italy, the highest possible government position just below the Italian king of course. But this story is not over just yet because as we know, Mussolini had to find some key ways of consolidating and maintaining power so he would avoid falling like the previous prime ministers that came before him. Using extensively his paramilitary groups, he would maintain himself in power but this we're gonna see in their next videos when we talk about his consolidation and maintenance of power.
All right, guys, so this closes off all of the factors that we're going to be discussing in this video. But just before we close off the video, I want to leave you guys with a little food for thought or a little historiographical argument that I want you to keep in the back of your heads as we continue discussing the fascist ideology during the videos on Mussolini's consolidation of power and Mussolini's policies as well. This debate is mainly concerned with whether fascism was a reactionary or revolutionary movement in Italy. I'm going to briefly explain uh, both theses and both sides, but all of this is going to be supplemented with our future videos. So so let me just briefly explain them. On the one hand, historians have argued that fascism was a reactionary movement claim that fascism sprang out of the general reaction following the industrialization, post-war period, and the democracy that was established in Italy. Historians like Alexander the Grand uh, are believers of this side, with Alexander the Grand even claiming that fascism was not a consistent ideology within itself, but rather a pragmatic political program aimed to maximize support, which we're going to see throughout our videos as Mussolini constantly changed the fascist ideology and its program, appealing to different groups at different times with often different and contradicting policies as well, all in the sake of growing his support base and assuring support. On the other hand, we have historians that argue that fascism was a completely revolutionary movement attempting to change and transform Italian society in its entirety, providing it with not only a new social economic system, but a new ideology of the self as well. I don't have any historians on my document as of now to reference in this video, but just before I include the notes uh, when I'm editing and putting them in the screen, I'll make sure to write them down, one, at least one of them down so you can uh, have a historian for this side as well, because I provided one from the, from the other side so I want to provide one for this side as well but like I said both sides are going to be supplemented with everything that we discuss from this point forward when we talk about the consolidation and maintenance of power of Mussolini and his policies as well with that said guys I'm going to close off the video right here it was incredibly long to record because there is a lot to unpack but I truly hope that you have followed everything uh, cohesively and well if not you can always rewatch the video on true time speed or whatever but I'm very happy at least because we have finally closed off Mussolini's rise to power with our fifth and final video. As always, make use of these notes that I always provide with you because they're my personal notes that I use in the IMB and they are really of great help. You can find them all linked in the description down below with, the, with the, this document in specific being in regards to this video and our past video as well. Please follow me on my Instagram at IBWithIan as I'm frequently making updates about the channel, posts, video summaries, uh, live streams as well, and so on. So if you want to be more in touch with the channel, I highly recommend you follow me over there. And if you have any doubts, questions, or concerns, you can always reach out through Instagram direct message, through the comments down below, or even by emailing me uh, on my email that shows up at the end of the video, which is IBWithIan at gmail.com. With that said, guys. Uh, watch the other videos on Muslims Vice Your Power as well because they are really complementing all of the information that I've provided. And stay tuned for our future videos on Muslims Consolidation as well. Uh, so yeah guys, uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!